Welcome and thank you for joining us for this Art, Art in the Libraries virtual program. We are excited to present this along with the West Virginia Women Vote Coalition. I'm Beth Torin, Interdisciplinary Cultural and Film Studies Librarian, hosting for Sally Brown Deskins, Exhibits Coordinator for WV Libraries, and Lead Curator of Undefeated, Canvassing the Politics Around Voter Suppression Since Women's Suffrage. As a reminder, the session is being recorded and will be documented on the library's website for public viewing. We encourage you to use speaker view and Zoom, and we welcome questions in the chat box, and we'll address them at the end of the presentation. During the presentation, we also encourage you to use the chat to engage with the content and one another. So following the session, we'll post a survey link to get your feedback. And I'm honored to turn this over to Susan Watkins, who joined the Charleston Area League in 1979, which is how she met Becky. Susan served in a, a variety of capacities at the local level, including president on two different occasions. Susan also served as secretary, voter newsletter editor, and president of the League of Women, Women Voters, West Virginia. Welcome, Susan. Thank you, Beth, and a special thank you to WVU Libraries for providing this informative series of programs. Rebecca Kane Separley, Becky the Most, has been a force for civic engagement for over 40 years. She joined the local League of Women Voters in Kanawha County in 1974. That was her springboard to an admirable life of working on a broad range of public po policy issues and advocating for the increased participation of women in politics. Becky served as the president of her local and state league. And then in 1972, she was elected president of the National League and served for six years. One of the crowning achievements of her tenure as president was the passage of the National Voter Registration Act, better known as the Motor Voter Law. Then in 1996, the Ladies Home Journal named her one of the most powerful women in politics in the nation in the category of issues advocates. After her league tenure, Becky worked on campaign finance reform as the president of Campaign for America. In 1999, she decided to focus her considerable energy on her community in West Virginia. She became the president and CEO of the Greater Kanawha Valley Foundation in Charleston, West Virginia. Her work there has had a lasting impact on many West Virginians through the grants and scholarships the foundation made to various community groups, nonprofits, and students. Currently, Becky is a member of the Charleston, West Virginia City Council, and she is president, of course. She also serves on the Charleston Urban Renewal Authority and the Charleston Convention and Bu Visitors Bureau. Over the years, Becky has been a shining example of service to her community, her state, and her nation. She has mentored many women along the way. As you can see, she is a super achiever. She's also warm, funny, and mischievous. She's a true and faithful friend. As a recipient of the Distinguished Alumni Award from both the WVU Political Science Department and the Eberly College of Arts and Science, it is only fitting that Becky is a participant in this series. Here's Becky now to talk about voting and voting Reg voter registration. Becky. Thank you, Susan. Um, thank you for the introduction. And I'll have to say getting to know you, getting to work with you, and getting to learn from you has been one of the most rewarding experiences of my league membership. So thank you. I also want to thank the WVU Libraries and the West Virginia Women Vote Coalition for sponsoring these podcasts. Too often, uh, we forget our history, and uh, we need to be reminded of the power that we have, the power of change that we have at our hands. Today, I thought I would briefly discuss the history of voting and registration, why some folks vote and others don't, what motivates particularly women to participate in the election process, and close with some ideas about what we can do to continue to make change in the electoral process and public policy in general. I look forward then to discussing the issues that might be on your mind. 
In um, the first presidential election, only white land-owning men were allowed to vote. And it seems that a lot of people wanted to keep it that way. Uh, in fact, John Adams warned in a letter in 1776 that if we expanded the voting rights to other parts of the population, that would be a, be a dangerous idea. And I quote, dangerous is the word he used. He went on further to write, and I quote, new claims will arise. Women, women will demand a vote. Lads with 12, uh, from 12 to 21 will think their rights not enough attended to. And every man who has not a farthing will demand an equal voice with any other in all acts of state, unquote. Well, slowly, regardless of Adam's warnings, we have made attempts to expand the voting rights to other parts of the population. In uh, 1870, as part of the Reconstruction package following the Civil War, the uh, passage of the 15th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution granted African-American males sort of a token uh, vote, right to vote, but it really wasn't until after the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act that prohibits uh, racial and language discrimination in voting that African Americans were really able to uh, exercise that right. And of course, we know that in 1920, the passage of the 19th Amendment to the US Constitution expanded the right to vote to women. Native Americans were granted citizenship in 1924 and thus secured the right to vote. And then in 1971, the 26th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution lowered the voting age from 21 to 18 years of age. And that, frankly, was due largely, if not totally, uh, in part to our then senior Senator Jennings Randolph. Well, while appearing to open the ballot box to all citizens of the United States, the system of state-run voter registration which was established in Massachusetts in 1800, has proven to be a roadblock to would-be voters rather than any kind of an invitation to participate in our democracy. In many places, it makes it harder to register to vote, and it was actually designed to do that. It was actually designed to keep eligible voters out of the ballot box. I mean, we didn't want any of those immigrants voting in 1800, and it has been used for many different populations of folks since to try to make it harder to vote. Some states only allowed citizens to register on like there were like seven days, only specific seven days that you could register, or you could only register on the Thursday before the election. But even today, we see attempts to erect barriers to voting, such as requiring a driver's license or closing polls in certain precincts or restricting early voting. In communities of color, we've witnessed distribution of flyers that told people to vote on the wrong days, or suggested that if they had voted in the primary, they couldn't vote in the general election, or using automated phone calls to tell people to vote in the wrong precinct. Well, we fought, women fought, for 72 years to win the right to vote. During that battle, we were not allowed to speak in public, we couldn't own property, and we had no constitutional legal rights. I mean, think, think about that. What, what, how hard that must have been. And uh, Susan B. Anthony, of course, fought her entire life for the right to vote. And unfortunately, she died before it happened, but she knew it was going to happen before her death, but she never got to legally vote. She did vote illegally one time and got arrested for it, but she never saw um, the 19th Amendment pass, but she knew it was going to. Well, after winning the, the franchise, uh, the women were faced with, you know, what do we do now? Well, I think if it were me, I would have said, woohoo, declare victory and go home, get some rest after such a battle. But you know, that's not what happened. Um, the National American Women Suffrage Association decided the fight wasn't over. Their members had seen the tactics used to suppress the vote of other citizens. 
So they changed the name of their organization to the League of Women Voters. This was to reflect their new found right, their new one right. And its mission became educating women on how to use the vote. During the first presidential election in which women were able to vote, only a third, only a third of the eligible women voters actually cast a ballot. Voting really is a type of behavior that's learned through repetition. And you know, once you've voted, you're more likely to vote again. But the development of this habit requires time and experience. And many older women who were raised prior to women's suffrage had been told over and over again that politics was the men's domain. And these women never, ever exercised their right to vote, never. So, in fact, it wasn't until 1980, the 1980 presidential campaign or election, that women voted in the same proportion as men. And of course, now we regularly outvote men. But that's also the same year that we see the gender gap uh, in terms of issues. But basically, there is no gender gap when it comes to the motivation for voting. People who can see a connection to what they care about and the voting process, they vote. People who can't see a connection, don't. Connecting issues like the future of their child's education, their job security and economic security for their families, their social security or Medicare benefits, having health insurance, lowering crime and violence, these are all compelling messages to get people to think about the election process and why they need to vote. Voters are frankly more likely to say that the election matters more to them than they believe they matter to the election. And for years in the League of Women Voters, we would tell people all the wonderful statistics, like if, if one person hadn't voted for precinct, uh, John Kennedy would never have been elected president. But people don't believe that it's their one vote that's going to make that difference. So connecting the issues they care about, seeing how it's going to change their lives, that's what makes, that's what motivates them. In terms of the women's vote, we tend to base our uh, vote on issues rather than party allegiance. In survey after survey, it's been found that party loyalty has more influence on man's vote than it does on a woman's. Women and men differ substantially on their views about issues. We tend to believe that budget cuts go too far, while men believe that they haven't gone far enough. The, this probably stems from the belief that women believe that government has an active role to play, while men believe that government's more of a problem than the solution. Women's economic worries are different than men's. Women worry most about unemployment, about jobs, about what they pay, uh, about benefits, especially retirement and health care. Men worry much more about the deficit and taxes. Women believe a government safety net is important. Men tend to think the highest priority should be for government to allow people to have opportunity. And again, these are stereotypes, if you will. Not all women believe the same and not all men believe the same. I just I want to make sure I make that clear. But when we've surveyed these folks, this is the majority of those who have surveyed uh, reflect these, these concerns and these issues. Women also worry about crime and violence. We rank children's safety in schools as our top crime concern. And that's ahead of even our own personal security. We respond to messages about values and about bringing people together. While we are more interested in social programs than most men, women also believe that policies will not work unless they're grounded in the right values. We yearn for common ground for our communities that unite to solve problems. Like men, we're disgusted by politics as usual, but we're particularly offended by what we see as the bickering and divisiveness that gets in the way of bringing people together. One of the most frequently cited explanations for non-voting in our country is that we're all politically alienated, so we just don't vote. However, when we surveyed folks, non-voters are no more alienated than the voters. We're all a little alienated. 
And an individual's level of alienation doesn't seem to have any impact on whether or not they'll vote. Voting is as much, or maybe even more, about community as it is about politics. To be sure, partisan attachments, perceptions of issue differences, and significance of electoral outcomes, along with our desire to give voice to our views, all help condition us to participate in the process. But equally significant, if not more so, is the degree to which we are integrated in our communities and the value that our friends and family place on voting. Those who have extensive social networks and who have uh, friends and family that value voting, they vote. Those who aren't involved in their communities and believe that their family and friends don't really care much about voting, well, they stay at home. So in, in many ways, electoral turnout reflects more clearly the character of our culture than the character of our politics. It's interesting to note that someone who's been contacted about voting is 22% more likely to vote than an individual who reports no contact. Club membership is one indicator of the strength of an individual social network. Membership in a PTA, uh, I'm dating myself, but what, what the organization similar to PTAs or PTAs uh, or a civic club have a uh, significant impact on the probability of voting. The probability of being a voter is 59% for people who belong to a civic club and 57% for PTA members. If you compare that to 45% for an individual who's a member of neither. And of course, we have known for years that age is the single most important determinant of voter participation. The older we get, the more likely we are to vote. For those of us engaged in voter registration and get out the vote drives, it's important to note that the non-voters place a, a greater value than voters on providing information about where to vote and the voting process. If you think about it, it makes sense. They have never experienced it. So it, that kind of information is important to them. The non-voters also feel keeping the polls open longer and same day registration would be helpful. Uh, same day registration allows you to register to vote when you go in to, uh, to cast your ballot. So if you're not registered, you can go ahead and uh, register and then vote and all do it in one day. And if you need to update it, if you're already registered, you need to update your registration, you can do it then too. Well, 15 states have same day registration. And it's interesting to note, Susan mentioned the motor voter law. When we started working on that, we really wanted same day registration, but it was so egregious to so many folks in Congress at the time that we scaled it back to uh, include motor voter. We also had a difficult time trying to include agencies, social service agencies um, in the bill, but we were, we were able to do that. And so that we could broaden the access to the registration. But anyway, 15 states are California, Colorado, Connecticut, Hawaii, Idaho, Illinois, Iowa, Maine, Maryland, Minnesota, Montana, New Hampshire, North Carolina, Wisconsin, Wyoming, and the District of Columbia. And again, states with this same day registration, very open, very easy, have an average turnout. Now this is in presidential years where turnout's always higher, but their turnout is about 67% on average. While those that don't have the same day registration, average turnout's about 58%. Non-voters also feel much stronger about the opportunity to vote by mail so that they feel that that's much more helpful uh, than, I mean, if we already vote and we know where the polls are and we're used to doing it, it seems to have less impact on us. But for those who've never voted uh, and don't vote, feel like that voting by mail makes it much easier and, and much more access to them. So, what does all this mean? What, what do we know? What we know about voters and non-voters, that can really help provide us with a roadmap 
to increase participation and strengthen our democracy. Based on this information, if we're looking at an effective campaign to increase voter turnout, that, that campaign needs to do four things. It needs to lower the structural barriers and perceptual barriers to registration and voting so that people can make it easy to do, make it um, easily understood and, and how to do it. It needs to communicate a message that suggests the outcome of the election will directly affect the issues that I care about. I mean, if I want my child to be able to play in the band or my daughter to get advanced math, um, then I better go vote in that school board election because those are the people going to decide that. If, if I can see that connection, I'm going to be there. Increase the perceived importance of voting in non-voting social networks. So work through the city clubs and organizations and um, make sure that they understand the process and educate them so that their members are even better educated in terms of, of voting. And you can't stress this enough, personal contact with non-voters and ask them to participate. It's, it's hard to do in a COVID environment, very, very hard. And so it'll be interesting to see how the campaigns, which are voter campaigns, get out the vote campaigns, uh, have to be much more removed and to see what impact that will have on how we are able to get, get the non-voters to the polls. Well, in addition to voting, there are many ways in which we can continually influence the election process. We can lobby members of Congress and the West Virginia legislature and city councils on important issues. We can uh, aggressively petition to repeal laws that we feel are unfair and, and practices that we feel are unfair. We can manage election campaigns. We can sponsor candidate debates and forums. We can influence public opinion on issues by publishing letters to the editor and writing columns for newspapers. We can contribute money to candidates who are running for office or to organizations that fund uh, candidates. We can distribute voter guides. Thank you, the West Virginia League of Women Voters, for your voter guide. And we can promote clean elections, clean campaigns, honest advertising, and force the candidates to, to live up to their claims of integrity and in public service. We can run for office. Not only can we run, we can win. And we as women can recognize our own political role models. Sometimes we forget about that. But young, young girls, young women, they need to see women, people like them, in positions of power. And we need to make sure that they understand there are women in those positions. And we can register citizens to vote, especially those who've been disenfranchised. We've made great strides in the past 100 years. But as the suffragists knew, the battle for equal access to the voting franchise is not over. We, as women, have the power of change in our hands. We owe it to those that went before us to continue to fight for all American citizens, to be able to participate equally and without intimidation in all acts of state. Thank you. Thank you so much, Becky. Um, Everyone, we'd love to hear your questions. Uh, what did you learn? Um, what questions do you have? Feel free to enter questions in the chat or you can unmute and, and speak. I have a question. This is Becca Aranda. Um, so I am in Morgantown and I really, really appreciate what our League of Women Voters do here and how active they are. I am not a member, unfortunately, um, and I think um, not, it's, it's really mostly laziness, honestly, um, and lack of ability to, to um, commit to another thing. Uh, but I, I find it interesting that the cost to become a member of the League of Women Voters is so high. And I'm just curious as to why that's different from a lot of other organizations. Um, and maybe, I mean, you obviously don't have a lot of control over that now, but I'm just kind of curious um, as to what the difference 
is in that? Because I'm wondering if that's prohibitive to people who are of different socioeconomic statuses. Well, I'll be able to start with that and then Jonathan might want to chime in too. Um, well, the organization is a three-level organization so that when you join the Morgantown League, you also join the West Virginia League and the National League. And all of those leagues, <laughs> that membership is divided then three ways. That the money is divided, not equally three ways, but um, but you pay a per member payment to state and a per member payment to national. Uh, we have we worried uh, 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 Rebecca about that a lot. Uh, so there are often uh, scholarships for people and particularly for students who want to become um, members of the league that can't pay that amount. I mean, I'll have to tell you, my when I joined the league back in 1974, my dad paid the dues, I couldn't afford the $30. I mean, you know, I was newly married, um, had, a, had a baby. I mean, we didn't have, I mean, $30 was a lot of money back then. And so my dad paid for it for me. So I, I understand what you're saying, uh, but there are ways that if people uh, and scholarships and so forth that um, folks can access. And, and Jonathan, maybe you wanna talk a little bit about, about the membership as well and the dues. Cool. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. So in Mon County, if you are a student, it's only $5 for the local league here. Um, the other league, other local leagues, which are, there are three other local leagues in the state. You can become a student member for free and on a state level too. If you're a student, you can become a member for free. Um, now I attended a council meeting with the national league several years ago and they were discussing like changing the PMP system altogether and maybe even creating a, a new system. And that's something I think they're still discussing, which would change that the cost the, and that barrier to membership. And we, we actually, on a local level, we, we actually tried scholarships out at one point and it was kind of a, it was like, like a pilot program. And, and then the people who we did, who were, did become members through, as a, through via scholarship never, for whatever reason, decided not to continue. So it's not wasn't clear to us whether cost was a barrier. But um, yeah, I mean, it's something I've always thought about. And I, when I was a local league president, I, I made a big issue out of it. And so hopefully, yeah, we'd like to see that change definitely in the future. Yeah, hopefully sooner than later. But yeah, and, all right. <laughs> uh, that's all I can. <laughs> I hope you join though, Be uh, Becca. <laughs> Thanks, Jonathan. I appreciate both of your answers. <laughs> oh, and and um, Becky. So, uh, Meredith Kiger um, mentions this morning. Pennsylvania news channels were advertising that you could res register when you came to vote. Hi, Meredith. It, it's uh, I, I can't see you, but uh, Meredith and I were sorority sisters in college. Um, the um, it's a state run process, uh, the voter registration. And so for particularly local and, and so forth elections. So um, I'm glad that Pennsylvania is going to jump on uh, that bandwagon because it is what needs to happen. So I'm, I'm glad to hear it and I'm, I'm glad to see your name on the screen. And maybe one of these days I can see you in person. And thank you. And Lee England um, asks, how do you become a member of the League of Women Voters? That's very easy. You just say, I want to be one and pay whatever dues are necessary. And, the, and we, we take all comers. Uh, there was a, a time that was restricted to women, but it is no longer. Men are active, as you can see, our state president is a man. Um, and so we have included our franchise began with just women because of the obvious, but um, it has been expanded and we've had male members and male leadership for years, uh, had a male executive director at the National League uh, probably 30 years ago. So um, all you need to do is, um, and Jonathan, you might be jotting down these names uh, of folks uh, who might want to be interested in joining and, and all you have to do is say, I want to be a member. I mean, when I said that, I, I called a friend, I saw, I saw their, um, I'd learned about them in college at WVU, I have a degree in political science. And so I, I thought that what a fascinating group of people. And they were in the newspaper, in the Charleston newspaper. 
And I thought, wow, and it named some names. And then I was talking to some friends and they said, oh yeah, we know, we know some of those folks. So I just called and said, what does it take? And they said, sit still, we're gonna come over and pick you up. We got a meeting today. So um, it's, it's very easy. It's not restrictive at all. And I, I, I think you will enjoy your membership and certainly do our democracy good. Thank you. And then Marion Austin shares that um, for our information, the history of voting rights for Black West Virginians is better than other states in the South. For example, in 1896, voters elected the first African American woman to serve in a legislative body in the United States. She was appointed to fill the unexpired term of her husband, E. Howard Harper of Welch in McDowell County. And in 1950, Elizabeth Simpson Drury of McDowell County became the first African American woman elected to the House of Delegates and served until 1964. Absolutely, and thank you for bringing that up, Marion. And Mary, it's good to see you too. Uh, I haven't seen you for a while either. Um, yes, um, and I think that's part of our history uh, and part of the, the West Virginia. We've been very good to. Um, try to do what we can, uh, but in terms of not being part of the Deep South when we didn't secede from the Union, I think that was it was helpful. And of course, we have fascinating, wonderful, and very qualified and capable African American women who have contributed much to suffrage, as well as to um, our, our government and uh, leadership in this country. And thank you, Lindell has put the uh, information about um, the Morgantown Monongalia County League in the chat. And and Vicki also says if you're in Mon County, she can help you join the league or direct you to another um, West Virginia league and uh, get information. Her uh, contact information is there in the chat. And um, ah, um, and Amanda Ray says, for those who would like to see more about voting rights, West Virginia Women Vote has produced a series of videos posted on Morgantown Now's Facebook and on their website. Um, Becky, I'm, I'm not exactly um, sure how, how to how to phrase this as a question, but I um, really I appreciate your uh, perspective on things because I know you know a lot more uh, kind of about how um, politics work than I do, frankly. But I do understand that um, I've been I've been voting as soon as I was allowed to, based on the model of my parents, and. Um, but now more than ever, I can understand why people feel like their vote doesn't count or might not be counted. That the threat of I, I'm I'm afraid to go to the poll because of COVID. I'm a, I'm very frightened that there will be violence at the polls. Um, not so much for my personal safety, but it's just um, such a a like a, a threatening time um, with this particular election and then I feel like but if I vote by mail then it's like even more likely to um, that, that that's a, such an enormous threat that that's going to be taken away for one reason or another which so I think it, there's like clearly we can see that there's still a huge fight going on about um, being counted. Well Just, I think I understand those concerns. I understand why you have them. Um, you know, um, first of all, there is, don't worry about the fraud with the mail registration, <laughs> mail voting, the mail in voting. It, 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 it is uh, overblown. All fraud, all voting fraud is very, very minuscule. And usually it's just something stupid that somebody does uh, and, and not a deliberate way to overthrow the, the election process. Um, so 
frankly, uh, and I hate to say this because it sounds so cynical, but it is true. Um, the politicians and candidates really don't want you to vote. They have um, a whole history of who votes and they know how you vote because that's a matter of public record. They can find, Beth, they can find out how many times you voted and you know they know whether you're a Democrat or Republican. It's public knowledge on the registration rolls. So anyway, but they only want their supporters to vote. So they want to suppress the participation and they are schooled in how to do that and how to make you afraid so you don't show up so that their people will. And the, the, they're schooled in how to, to speak and to, that will turn you off and that will turn on their supporter. Um, so it, it, the belief that all politicians and all candidates want you to show up is a false one. That's where there is a fraud and people being false to you. It is not in the election process. It is not, um, you know, the mail-in ballots. It is not through registration. It is, it is through making you fearful. And that makes it all more important that you show up. You, don't let that fear take your right away from you. That, don't let them do it to you. Show up or vote by mail if you're, if you're concerned about COVID. I voted absentee. Uh, I'm in, as you can see, I'm in a little mature class of folks and I'm a cancer survivor and, and I have issues. So I, I got an absentee ballot. I then drove down to the courthouse and put it in the ballot box in the courthouse. I didn't mail it in. And in the primary, I mailed it in. Um, I have all the faith in the world in our election officials and those that talk about fraud and they have talked about fraud forever, but no one proves it. So please don't let, don't let that fear take this away from you. Th uh, thank you. I always, I often feel fear, but try never to act from, from that place. I, I try to think, what would I do if I wasn't afraid? We'll just do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> just put it put aside for a moment. Hey, okay, here's one from uh, Linda Goldberg. Does the league still use the consensus model to take positions? I found that very inhibiting when I belonged from 84 to 1994. Um, yes, we have consensus and we also have a, a shorter um, process that uh, that we use because it became very uh, difficult for people who are who have limited time and um, Jonathan and Vicki and others who are active uh, more active now than um, can also describe to you uh, the process but the consensus process is that we don't vote it is the fact that can you live can you live with this um, and if you can and if if everybody can in the room we study the issues. You know, it's interesting. People want to accuse the league of being either Democrat or Republican. Well, we study the issue regardless, and we never talk about party affiliation. And it's interesting. We have a, a position on free trade. And we had a position on free trade, and it was a Republican issue. We still have a, 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 um, a, a position on free trade, and it's a Democrat issue. They change. We don't. And it's that consensus process that helps us, again, it goes back to our roots to, to learn about the issues. The league has always felt strongly that women should have a say, not just in issues that are social issues or for children, but in all issues, regardless whether it's the environment, international relations, uh, the economic uh, sectors, all of those, we're governed by those rules and, and we should also be able to participate in them and have a voice. Um, so yes, the consensus was part so that we could learn and make make decisions and then agree to it. But it, it can be very frustrating if you have hold very strong positions. However, no one, I doubt anybody, believes 100% in every one of the league's issues because we've got a multitude of them at all three levels of government. Um, but occasionally, you know, you have a, a personal difference and, and that's fine. Um, and, and, and people can't understand how we, we take positions, but at the same time, we want you to have yours too. And we want you to show up. We want you to participate. And it may be just the opposite of ours.
Okay. Um, thank you, Becky. Uh, and any last questions from from the floor? Or Becky, anything else you'd like to share? Well, I'd just like to thank everybody for showing up and for caring enough to be on, on this uh, particular podcast and encourage them to, to speak to their friends and colleagues and get, get them to get out the vote. And um, regardless of how you vote, just do it. And again, I thank you so much for your time and caring for being on here. You have lots of things that you could do today. Uh, it's a beautiful day here. So I appreciate so much that you would spend the time thinking about, learning about, and talking about the election process in our democracy. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you everyone for, for being here and for your patience at the beginning. Uh, it just took a few minutes we got going. Um, and we'd like to ask you to please help us improve by completing the brief assessment survey. There's a link to it in the chat. And we'll follow up with an, with an email uh, for a link to it as well. And lastly, I'd like to remind you of our Art in the Library's email newsletter that will have an invitation to the next session, which is October 17 from 1 to 3, featuring the Women of Appalachia Spoken Word Program. Our past virtual programs are available on the WVU Library's YouTube page, and I'll post that information in the chat. And so, and if you, if you aren't on that, if you aren't getting that Art in the Library's newsletter, um, Sally's contact is there and, you, and you'll also have an uh, opportunity to um, ask for that in, in the survey that you'll get in the email um, or to contact Sally directly. Um, so thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, um, Vicki and Becky. And um, this was very moving and informative. Great job, everybody. Thank you.